So glad you're here with us this morning. Uh, in the early 2000s, a man named Roger Cadenhead did something really interesting. He bought a very specific website, benedict16th.com. And the reason he did this is because the Pope at that time, John Paul II, was about to pass away, and he made a total guess as to who might be the next Pope, thinking that if Benedict XVI actually became the next Pope, then he would have something that the Catholic Church really wanted, this URL. Sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Pope passed away, Benedict XVI became the next Pope, Pope, and pretty soon the Catholic Church came to Roger Cadenhead and said, hey, you have this website, we want to buy it from you, how much would you like? And Roger Cadenhead had a very interesting reply to that. He did not want money. He said, okay, I'll make a deal with you, I want three things. Number one, I want a stay at the Vatican, like put me up in the Vatican, I, I, I want to stay there. Number two, and this is not a joke, this is a true story, he said, I want a replica of the Pope's hat. Like, give me the actual hat. Just be really cool to wear out in public. And then he said, I want complete absolution for what I did on March 20th, 1987. We don't know what he did on March 20th, 1987, but we do know that whatever he did, it has been crippling him emotionally, mentally, and spiritually ever since. I tell this story to bring up a very simple truth. Sin is enslaving. And this can be in the present. You, you're addicted to gambling or drunkenness or pornography, materialism. It can be enslaving. You're always envious of somebody else in the present. It can also be enslaving in the past, just like Roger Caden had. You think about, oh, I can't, I can't stop replaying what I did years ago in my head. We, we're all subject to what's called the human condition. There's something wrong with the human race. My first memory of knowing something was wrong, that I was a sinful being, or one of my first memories, was when I was 10 or 11, I was walking in the neighborhood with a friend, and I was carrying a basketball, and this other boy was walking in the neighborhood, small boy, and my friend said, hey, but you can't hit that other kid in the head with the basketball. And I said, I bet I can. And so I threw this basketball across the street, and I hit this kid in the head, and he fell over, he started crying, and he got up, he was okay, but I wasn't because it was the first time in my life where I realized, oh, I have this insidious infection deep in my soul that wants power, that, that likes to exert himself over another. And it, it was scary to me, even as a 10-year-old boy. It was my first experience with the human condition called sin. So we're in a series right now, a sub-series, uh, called The Mission of Jesus. And we're exploring what, what did Jesus come to do? What were his goals? What were his aims? What were his objectives when he came to the earth? Because as his disciples, if we don't understand what he wanted to do, it's going to be very hard for us to adopt or share that mission. And so I'd like to dive into one of the most dense passages in the Bible about why Jesus came, and then use some illustrations to help explain and think through what this text means. So this is Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh 
to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. These verses to the typical Christian have the effect of something like this. We know they're good, and we know that they mean really wonderful things for the life of the believer, but when we get into the detail of this, it's a little confusing actually what Paul is talking about. So I want to use uh, some illustrations here. Some, one of our new members, Matt Ware, helped design some of these pictures. You won't be able to see the picture on the stage super clearly, so we'll have it blown up on the screen. And then uh, Andrea Rieger did a really good job helping put this all together for this sermon. So it's really important, especially with Romans, to think about what, what exact storyline are these passages trying to, to get at? So Romans 8 is telling a story that, ha- that goes, goes to the very, back to the very beginning. So I want you to think about the very beginning of the Bible. We got Genesis 1. God creates this beautiful world, and he tells Adam and Eve to be fruitful, increase in number, and multiply. And this, in one sense, is God's way of saying, this is the abundant, meaningful, flourishing life that I want for all human beings. God wants us to partner with him and steward all of creation in good, meaningful, flourishing ways. The next thing that happens in the biblical story is that sin comes into the picture. Now normally, when we think about sin, we think about an individual act that you do that's wrong. So when I threw this basketball at this other boy's head, it, it was a sin. I, I had made a wrong decision. That's normally what we think about with the word sin. When the word sin first appears in the Bible in Genesis 3, it's actually its own power. So the first time the word sin is used in the Bible, it's, it's used in this way. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. So notice there's this uh, cosmic, almost personality or power behind this word sin, which I would call capital S sin. It's a, it's a power enacting itself onto the world. Or later in the New Testament, we read in James, sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. So we might commonly think of sin as individual acts that we do, but in the story of the Bible, sin is a kind of power that comes upon people. And so you can see it very clearly in, in early in the Bible with, with the story of Cain and Abel. Sin comes into Cain's life, and he, he really wants Cain to think that Cain is better than Abel. Abel. In fact, if, if I could narrow down, to like, what is the primary strategy? Like, if you think about sin as a power, what's the strategy? What's, how is he trying to corrupt the world? One way to think about that is it's primarily through the exaltation of the self. If sin as a power can get you and me to exalt ourselves above another, then sin grows in the world. It happened to me when I was 10 with, with Cain here. It's you're a little bit be- better than your brother. Your sacrifice is, is just a little bit better than your brother. Your motivations are a little bit better than your brother. And so you, you have sin coming into Cain's life and and resulting in murder. And so sin keeps doing this as as the biblical story moves forward. So God makes things that are really good like friendship or marriage or intelligence or work ethic. And then sin, each time something good is there, he twists it and thwarts it through this strategy of exaltation of self. And so we've, we come to another climactic scene in the Old Testament where we can learn a lot about sin, and it's the giving of the law. So Exodus has happened, the people have gone through the Red Sea, and now you have Moses who comes down from Mount Sinai and he gives them the, the Ten Commandments. It's a very iconic scene in the Bible. So if you remember, when Moses comes down, the people build a golden calf at the bottom of the mountain. This is a really helpful contrast to understand one of the things that 
uh, sin likes to do. Sin takes good things and he twists them. So the law, which is referenced in Romans 8, is really good. When you think about, or when you compare the Old Testament, the law, the Torah, to other ancient Near, Near East documents, it, it is an, an incredible contribution to the, the flourishing of human life. In fact, the law, in theory, can produce this kind of a life. The abundant, just, beautiful life. The law can do that. But as many of us know, it, it didn't really work out that way. So what, what sin does is it takes the law and it uses the law to magnify itself. So there, N.T. Wright wrote a book last year. It's like a 250-page book on one chapter of the Bible, Romans 8. And a lot of this thinking comes from that book. But one illustration he uses, which I think is really helpful, is he says that, you know those old school uh, transparencies projector we used to sing, like worship songs this way? You'd put the, uh, the song, the transparency on the projector, and the light would shine it up on the screen, and it would make it really big. So the, the song was actually pretty small, but the projector and the light made it really big. Well, that's what the law does to sin. It, it amplifies sin in the world. So think about this. Moses comes down, has these commands of God, and from the perspective of sin as a power, sin would say, okay, you got these words, Yahweh. Those very words are going to highlight just how wicked these people are. If you take away the law, yes, the golden calf is bad, but when you add the law, the golden calf is seen as even bigger than it actually is. So the law magnifies sin. And so if you notice here, sin starts small in Genesis 3, and then as you move forward through the Old Testament, sin gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and so sin just keeps corrupting people. Like, okay, you got man after God's own heart, David, I got him with Bathsheba. You got Solomon, got a lot of wisdom, I'll get him with money. So sin just, just keeps corrupting people all, all throughout the Old Testament. In fact, it gets to this point. So at the, at the end of the book of Daniel, there's this really sad line where it says, all of Israel has transgressed. Like it, everybody. Like the sin is getting really, really big now, and it's pulling the whole nation of Israel down. And so then you think about this point as between the Testaments. You have this baby that's born, supposed to be the next great prophet, and he grows up, and sin as a power does what it always does with prophets it twists and corrupts and, and, and tries to tempt. Jesus. But there's something different about Jesus. Jesus doesn't succumb to these temptations. Money doesn't work with Jesus. Uh, sex doesn't work with Jesus. Power doesn't work with, with Jesus. He's, he keeps resisting all, all these normal tactics from, from sin. This whole exaltation of self is not working with Jesus. And so what is this power of sin? I and mean, you think about sin, Satan, death is almost a, a trinity of darkness. What, what do they do when Jesus is not succumbing to the main strategy? Well, you, you kill him. So in John 13, we have this line where Satan entered into Judas. Well, why does, why does Satan enter into Judas when Judas takes the bread? It's because Satan wants... Jesus to die. And so then we come to our next picture here to illustrate this story of sin. And we have the cross. And at this point, sin is really, really big. So notice sin has grown. Sin starts here. Law makes it look even bigger. But now we have sin in its totality funneling onto this one spot, onto the cross. And so what's happening at the cross here is several things. One, Jesus in one human life is representing all of Israel. So if you think about uh, Isaiah, the suffering servant passages point to this idea that one person is going to come along and represent the totality of all the people of God. That's Jesus, and he's now here on the cross. But more than Israel, Jesus also represents all of humanity. So way back to the beginning, human beings have been corrupted by this power called sin, 
which has grown and grown and grown. So Jesus is representing all of humanity under the weight of sin. And so just like tomorrow, there's going to be this amazing eclipse and a lot of light is going to be funneled into one spot, so much so that if you look at it the wrong way, you will go blind. So in the same sense, all of sin is now being funneled into one single point in time, to one single person in time, and this is on Jesus Christ. So, in this moment, sin does its worst to Jesus on the cross. Thinking about Roman Empire, Roman Empire is the clearest expression of self-exaltation at the time. So sin, or Satan, through the Roman Empire, comes and, and kills the Son of God. So pause here, take a breath. With these four pictures in place, I'd like to go back to the text of Romans 8, reread that same section with this as the backdrop. Some of these complicated sentences start to make sense when that's the storyline. So going back to this text, we're actually going to go back to Romans 7, which sets up Romans 8. Look at what Paul says. Is the law sinful? Certainly not. This is a really important thing that Paul's saying. This is not bad. Moses and the law was a really, really good thing. However, Paul says next, but sin, notice it's a power here, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment produced in me every kind of coveting. The law is fine. In fact, the law in theory can lead to this beautiful and abundant life. But sin as a power seized the opportunity through the law and made human beings feel these temptations to do the wrong thing. Verse 3. What the law was powerless to do. We're going to have to go line by line here. I know for some of you, you're like, whoa, Phil, get back to your funny stories. This is too complicated. But this is so important. It's one of the most central passages about the gospel in the whole Bible. So just, just stay with me here. Verse 3, for what the law was powerless to do. What was it powerless to do? The law could not produce the abundant Edenic life. Not because the law was bad, because of but because of the material it was working with. The law was working with corrupt human beings like you and me, and that's what the next line says. What the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. Not because the law is bad, but because our flesh could not do what God wanted it to do. So then what could be done? Next line. What the law was powerless to do, God did. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, to be a sin offering. And so, he condemned sin in the flesh. This is a really critical statement in the Bible. God condemned sin in the flesh of Jesus. Let's go back to this picture. How how exactly does this happen? So sin puts Jesus on the cross. Sin is trying to kill Jesus in Sin believes that this is its ultimate victory, this horrific, violent, public lynching of this young man. And then something goes wrong. This young man won't stay dead. There's, there's this different kind of power that all through the first part of the Bible story, sin had never dealt with this kind of power. But at the cross, it comes into full display, and it's actually the power of the emptying of self. So the main strategy from sin as power is the exaltation of self, but then at the cross, there's this great battle between the power of sin and the power of God, and sin comes in, into the light of this different kind of power, the, the emptying of self. And it's not just any person practicing some self-sacrifice. This is God, the let there be light God, who has now poured himself out. He's he's emptied his very self, and sin can't deal with that power. It it, it can't overcome this kind of a power. So here's, I was thinking about how to, more clear ways to explain this or how we could think about this. If I take a a screwdriver and I start driving in a, a, a screw into a piece of wood, 
the more I turn that screw, it's going to get tighter and tighter and tighter and stronger and stronger and stronger. But if I, if I turn it too much, the, the, the screw strips and it no longer has a hold anymore. And then it doesn't matter how hard I turn the screwdriver, there's no more power left in that screw. This is what happens to sin on the cross. All throughout the story of human history, it's, it's had this grip on the human heart. It has, it has brought creation deeper and deeper and deeper into darkness and evil, but then on the cross, it, it comes into contact with the power that it can't deal with. And so in a sense, sin is stripped of all of its power on the cross. And this, this is so important because sometimes people will, will look at the cross and they'll say things that have, it, they have good intentions by this, but it's just not good theology. God does not condemn Jesus on the cross. That's why you got to pay very careful attention to the words in Romans 8. God condemns sin on the cross, and that's such a different storyline. John 3.16 does not say, for God so hated the world that he killed his son. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. So God and Jesus, they're together on the cross, going into the heart of darkness for the sake of the world that they both love. The, the cross is not some vindictive God taking out his wrath on this, on his son and, and some twisted version of divine child abuse. What the, the cross is, it's the self-emptying love of God going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the self-exaltation of sin and of Satan. And the, the final result of that is this next picture. Getting back to the first verse of Romans. There is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. So sin simply can't keep Jesus down. Jesus comes out of the grave, and so now there's, there's no way that sin can condemn God's people any longer. And, 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 and here's the reason this is really important. God condemned sin. God doesn't condemn you. He doesn't condemn me. He condemns sin. And because God condemns sin, then sin no longer has the power to condemn you or to condemn me. So this is a liberating truth for all of God's people. There truly is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so, what does this have to do with day-to-day -day life? Let me, let me look at this. Let's take a look at this final picture here. So you, this next verse is so important here. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God condemns sin, sin in the flesh. And this is important. In order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. So the reason the gospel happens here is actually so that we can have the possibility of living this life the abundant, flourishing, full life, which, to put all these pictures together, in theory the law was supposed to give us this life, but it couldn't because of the power of sin. Now, sin has been broken through this incredible self-emptying love of God, and so now, therefore, it is possible to have this beautiful, abundant, flourishing, content, joyous life for disciples, and the difference is it's the Holy Spirit. So look back at the text here, because Paul next brings the Holy Spirit onto the page. In order that, so God condemns sin in the flesh of Jesus in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully in, met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. In other words, we can now experience the goodness of the law, the goodness of creation, the goodness of life because of the Spirit who lives in our hearts. So when we open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit... The Spirit always pulls us away from this. The Holy Spirit will always make you less absorbed with yourself, and the Spirit will make you more emptying of yourself. And the only way you can live that full, abundant, wonderful, generous life is through the emptying of yourself. And the more you lean on the Holy Spirit, that's what you actually start to do. So yes, 
I know you deal with sin, and I deal with sin too. Like, w- your heart is, the, is ground zero of the battle. But when you open yourself up to the Holy Spirit, the power of sin cowers. Sin, sin can't stand up in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now notice one final observation here. Who is the primary actor in this storyline? It's God. God makes the world. God stays with Israel when Israel screws up. God makes the covenant. God goes with Jesus onto the cross to take all the weight of sin and evil and darkness and death into his very being. This is all an act of God. And he does this because he loves you. And so why, going back to this very first verse, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why is that true? It's not because you read your Bible. And it's not because you go to church. It's not because you pray. And it's not because you do the right thing. It's not because you're a nice person. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because God loves you. This is the story of God. This is the move of God. And we as his children happen to be caught up in the graces of God. And so be really careful in those moments in your life where you're like Roger Cadenhead, really stuck in the past. Oh, I hope God forgives me of such and such. When we get caught into those mental loops, we're diminishing the power of what happened on the cross. God condemned sin. And so when you allow it to still accuse you, you're giving sin more power than it actually has. But when you open yourself up to the Holy Spirit, I promise you, the power of sin starts to decrease in your life. And the main way you do this is you lean here. The less and less you think of yourself, the more open you are to the Spirit's work in your life. You can grit your teeth, you can try really hard, or you can simply gaze upon the glory of the cross and let the love of God sweep you away. Because pretty soon, beholding changes the beholder. So we're going to gaze at the glory of God. We're going to sing again, and if you have any kind of a prayer need, our shepherds are going to be in the back of the room. They'll be happy to meet with you and pray with you. If you'd like to give your life to Christ and baptism and join this incredible story, because this is your story too, then I'll be down front if you'd like to do that. Let's stand and let's sing.